Hello and welcome to the Knowing and Growing show. In this edition I'm going to be looking at sustainability but not from a, a purely environmental point of view. I'm going to be looking at the, the bigger question of how do we get into the state of mind to be sustainable in how we live our own lives, how we run our organisations and so on. And in particular I'm going to be looking at the question of what can be done to change our minds. So this is sustainability in the context of behaviour change. Can we change our minds? Can we become more in tune with those things we're trying to live in harmony with? That's the topic of this discussion. And what I'm going to be showing you in this show is a narrated version of a presentation I gave back in December 2014 at Bangor University to their sustainability think tank. And the whole remit of this group is multidisciplinary exploration of how can we as an organisation, how can individuals be more sustainable in how they live. And what I'd like to present to you here is a reflection on that that takes us beyond theory into a way of being and how knowing and growing is very much about sustainability, being emotionally intelligent and all such things. So I'm going to start by looking at how we learn through experience by our very nature of being humans and then taking the idea of experience, what do we mean by a transcendent experience? And then I look at individuals and organisations within what I call the transcendence movement, which is those who practice a way of being, which is more transcendent in its whole approach to life. And then relate that to a process of change, of changing how we think, how we behave, and give you a few examples. And throughout this I'm going to include, as I try to do in all my knowing and growing shows, some real exercises that you can do yourself so that you can feel what I'm talking about. Okay, let's get back to, to basics. Uh, any of you who have done anything on the teaching and learning, so any of you who have looked into teaching and learning will be familiar with Kolb's learning cycle. Kolb was the first person, or one of the first, to recognise that we, as human beings, learn through experience. But we'll have some sort of experience, we'll reflect on it, take a step back, we'll conceptualise that, and then we'll experiment around it until we embody that experience into a whole new understanding of what life is and what's possible. So it's a well-known basis for all experiential learning, be it in an academic setting or, or in our day-to-day -day lives. And there are many versions of Kolb's learning cycle. This is the version I like to present. So one, I've presented it as a spiral, and I think this is important, that it's not a circle. We don't want to keep going around in circles, do we? We want to enhance our understanding of the world. We want to grow. So this is an outward spiral. So again, we'll have an experience, we'll reflect on it, and through that reflection, we'll accept what happened in that experience, we'll learn and grow in our understanding of it, in our, our understanding of ourselves, of the world we live in. An ongoing process of experience, reflection, acceptance and thus growth. Okay, let's move on now to what we mean by an experience, and there's all sorts of experiences. I don't know if this person is familiar to you, it's Sir Alistair Hardy. Now, Alistair was a very well known in his days, in particular for oceanography. He did a lot of work on plankton and he was knighted for his contribution to the fishing industry. And he, he in his time he was on the scientific he was on the scientific expedition on the ship the Discovery. 
again, which looked into plankton and that side of the ocean world. And he was very interested in not just how these creatures work, but in the bigger question of evolution, of behavioural selection, of how we evolve not just through physical changes, but in how we behave. But besides being an eminent scientist, Sir Alistair was also an accomplished artist. This is one of his works. And we're told that on his expedition, on the discovery, he would hang over the, the rail of a ship in order to see the creatures, to see, to really experience the ocean in which he was travelling, to better grasp the creatures and the environment which he was studying. And so he knew not just through scientific understanding and study, but through engaging in the whole world in which the things he was studying lived. And so he, after he retired, set up the Religious Experiences Research Centre, now housed at Lampeter University, in, again in Wales. And with this centre, he began serious academic research into religious, spiritual, or what I would call transcendent experiences. And these are any experiences which, which take us out of ourselves, that take us to a, a different level of consciousness. So we might call them peak experiences after uh, Maslow, for example, or they may have a particular religious or spiritual association or we may refer to them as a mystical experience, in that they seem out of this world, although really they are perfectly normal and natural. But it's a very similar state of mind, that which we get in these experiences, to being in the zone or in the flow. So the sportsman, the athlete, who is totally with the moment, totally with himself and the experience of competing, in his race or his game. And when you are in the zone, you're not consciously thinking about things, you just do things. You're in a, a different state of mind. And so Alistair Hardy set off to explore this idea of having these experiences and what we gain from them. And he spoke about the fruits of such an experience. So in my own PhD studies, I use a questionnaire which I went out and asked various people who'd had not just one experience but a sequence of these transcendent experiences and I asked them this question. I asked them to say something about the fruits of their experience. What did it prompt them to think or do? Did it influence the decisions they were making at the time? And this is based on the questionnaire that Alistair Hardy himself used in his study of experiences, and which is still used by the Religious Experiences Research Centre today. So that's a theory. What I'd like you to do now is to try to get a feel for what I'm talking about. So what I invite you to do, and after I've given you the instructions, do pause this video and give yourself time to really think about this. What I'd like you to do, close your eyes and take your mind back to a particular time or place where you felt particularly connected to the natural world. Take your mind back and reflect on an experience it may have lasted a few seconds, it may have lasted many minutes or even hours. An experience where you felt particularly at one with nature. You may have been walking on a seashore, you may have been watching a sunset or an eclipse. Reflect. Think about a time 
when you were transported mentally, emotionally into some different state of mind where you felt at one with life itself. Take your mind back and reflect on it and perhaps write about it. Write a story about it. Share that experience. Write a poem about it. And please post those stories, those experiences as a comment to this video. Okay, so you've hopefully just reminded yourself of a particular transcendent experiences that you have had. And Alistair Hardy helped you to look at that experience and to be aware of maybe what influences it had in your life. And certainly in my own research, I found that people who had an ongoing sequence of these experiences found that it helped them to put life into perspective. It helped them to realise that they were part of something bigger than themselves. And I call these individuals who are open to such experiences and benefit from them. Collectively, they are the Transcendence Movement. It's not a formal movement, it's just a collection of anybody who has these sorts of experiences and works with them. And so we within the movement see life as part of a co-creative evolutionary consciousness. It's not us separate from the world. It's the idea that God helps those who help themselves. That by enabling these experiences and reflecting on them, so we become more whole in ourselves and more integrated into the world around us. And those who are committed to this process as part of our personal growth get far more from it. And we realise that by accepting the world as it is, it may mean having to let go of some old ideas, but we can change, we can grow, we can become more whole in and of ourselves. And it's all about being more holistic in our whole approach to life, which often means stepping outside the various labels we give ourselves, the isms and neologies, I call it, particularly the idea of dualism that we are thinking, feeling human beings, aren't we? And so by ha when we have these transcendent experiences, we realise that there is no separation between ourselves and the, the oneness of life, between the natural ourselves and the natural world. It is this holistic way of being. And that gives us a very different perspective on life. Another thing I learned within my PhD studies was that all too often we can get caught up in our labels, in the concepts and the theories. And so I, I came up with this spectrum, which I call the general and the specific. So when we have an experience, we, we have a general feeling about it, don't we? we? We sense the gist, the essence of an experience, like, wow, <laughs> we just feel part of the wonder of life. And then we might know the specific time and place that this occurred. We know the specific people we were with, who and what might have triggered and, ena triggered and enabled this experience. But all, all too often when we're talking about this intellectually in our academic studies, we're told to be specific in how we label it we have to specify whose theory it relates to. We have to specify what model it fits into. And all too often I found in my personal experience as well as in my own studies, both academically and otherwise, that sometimes we can get too attached to the theories and the concepts. And in doing so, we lose touch with this the feeling, this deeper transcendent feeling. We lose touch with the specifics 
and for people we were with, the times and the places. And so I'm reminded of one thing that philosophers are generally agreed upon. And if you think about it, that's quite unusual for philosophers to be in agreement. And William James puts it very succinctly. He says that knowledge about a thing is not the thing itself. Think about that. The labels we attach to something, the theories, the knowledge in intellectual and academic term isn't the thing itself, is it? It's just the label. It's just the label. So this is Gene Kelly singing in the rain. We don't get wet by describing rain, do we? If you want to understand rain, you need to be out in it, you need to feel it, you need to hear it, you need to experience it with all your senses. And that is the sort of experience I'm talking about. But if we want to change our perspective on something, we need to feel it in our hearts, with our fingers. We need to know what it is at a more, much more deeper level of connecting, of engaging in the world around us. And so what I found is, what I found in my research and in my life and in dealing with other people within the Transcendence Movement, is that when we truly engage with something at a much deeper level than the intellectual understanding, then we can create win-win scenarios. We can truly cooperate because we're engaging with people with a deeper understanding of what life's really all about. And so we can see this ability to transcend rational thought. And by transcending rational thought, I don't mean denying it. To transcend something is to embrace it. We are thinking, feeling human beings. We need a rational mind, but we also need our emotions to be heard. To be emotionally intelligent is not to deny or suppress our emotions, it's to, to live them, to be with them, to engage with them and help and enable those emotions to help us live, to cooperate. And this we see in all sorts of areas of, of life, even within education. And in a moment I'll just briefly overview some trends in teaching and learning. Another example of this might be acceptance and commitment therapy. Again, I've no time to go into that now, but if you look that up, you'll see how coming out of transpersonal psychology, out of positive psychology, and a lot of scientific investigations in many areas, we're seeing that it is possible to change minds. We can change our behaviour, but only by really getting to grips with our deeper emotions, how we react to things, and how we really think and feel and know something. Another example would be in how religion has progressed to secular spirituality, to the interfaith and interspiritual movements where we're concerned with an inherent spirituality about life itself rather than about religion. So all of these things are part of this transcending going beyond our normal rational way of thinking and it's through that that we can genuinely change. So in teaching and learning, we now talk about embedded learning, not just the facts as isolated facts, not we need to be beyond the objective facts and to embed them in our own lives and our own understanding of them. Likewise, some of you may be familiar with the idea of threshold concepts, and that is that in any topic, we need to get beneath the words to what is the gist of the topic. What is it that makes this topic difficult to grasp? And to me, the essence of behaving in a sustainable manner to being emotionally intelligent is to recognise that beyond our rational mind is our, a deeper sense of knowing. 
there is a inherent wisdom that we can all tap into. And to get there, we need to be reflective. So it's no coincidence that one of the big trends in teaching and learning, and indeed in professional development in many professions, is this need to be reflective, to take a step back, to see things as they really are, beneath what our rational mind may be telling us. So I'd like now to give you an example of that, of how reflective practice can really change us. So uh, at Bangor University, I've devised and yeah, I've devised and enable, I've devised and facilitate a series of workshops called Wisdom at Work. So I introduce people to relaxation and reflection using Reiki healing, I introduce them to emotional intelligence, how we can make friends with time rather than try to manage it. I help them to look at how cultural awareness is, is a much deeper thing than purely what country someone may come from. And we look at how by knowing ourselves and what, what makes us tick, we can perhaps find a better career for ourselves. So all these are ideas of how to survive in the workplace, to succeed in whatever our work happens to be, we need to get beneath the rational, beyond the rational. And one way of doing that is through reflective practice. And so one of the sessions I run is called How to be Reflective Using Mandalas. Now mandalas are, are any circular picture, as used by a number of indigenous tribes around the world, as used by Tibetans, for example. And it's the idea of the power of a circle. And in this exercise, I describe what a mandala is and what it may or may not include. I give my students paper with a circle on it, I give them a choice of various crayons, pastels, felt tip pens, and so on. And I put on a nice bit of relaxing music and I say, just create. There are no rules. You're not being judged on this as a piece of art. The idea is just to reflect. Allow what's within you to come out. So for example, you might come out with something like this. This was a, a mandala I created myself a few months ago when I was devising this or similar presentations. I didn't prejudge it, I just allowed myself to create this mandala. And that's exactly what students do in this class. And first time I ran this class, a group of students come in and they were looking totally miserable. They were unhappy, they were depressed, they were just mm, lethargic. If they were doing anything it was just tapping away on their smartphones. And I felt, oh dear, <laughs> uh, this is going to be hard work. They were not engaging with me with anything really. But I persuaded them to turn the phones off and to just listen to the introduction to this mandala session. And then I gave them their materials and I said, just allow yourself to create this mandala. And literally within 10-15 minutes, they were concentrating away. They were, their eyes were lighting up. They were engaging. They were busy with the drawing, with the painting, enjoying the sensation of messy pastels. And at the end of the, the session, 50 minute session, they all said how much they valued that experience. They were all so much more alive and alert and engaging with me, with each other, with life. Just the act of going into a reflective state of mind, of doing something creative, had changed where they were in their mental state. And the mental state they were in is one I would describe as direct apprehension. They were knowing how they felt. They were connecting to how they really felt deep within and that was coming out through their drawings, through their mandalas. And so 
in the course I run with the Body Mind Institute called The Essence of Knowing, I talk about how knowing is far more than the intellectual knowing. It's even more than the experiential knowing that Cole talked about. We need the balance between those two, but we also need this deeper direct apprehension, this inner knowing, this body knowing. And more and more is coming out of our scientific research on how when we first have an experience as a youngster, that experience is embodied in our whole being. It is more of a, a muscular memory, perhaps a body knowing. And it's that which we need to change if we're going to change our behaviour. It's that that we need to tap into. It's at that level that we can make serious changes in how we think and become more emotionally intelligent, more sustainable. I appreciate this has been a, a very a intense, very brief insight into all these ideas. And I invite you to take some of my courses on the Body Mind Institute to find out more. But just for now, let me just end by saying that what I'm talking about, this transcendent experience, transcendence movement, is a whole ranch of individuals and groups all over the world which are approaching life in this transcendent mode of consciousness. And within this movement are a huge number of organisations around the world. These are just three which are based, sorry, four which are based within the UK. Alistair Hardy, I've just been talking about his study of spiritual experiences. The Rekin Trust, which talks about whole body, whole world. And by becoming whole within ourselves, then we can naturally be more sustainable in our thoughts. And if you go to my website, you'll see links to all these organisations and many, many more. So, to conclude, when we talk to individuals within the Transcendence Movement, we will find people who have successfully changed bad habits, who have successfully found a way of relating to themselves, to each other, to the world, which reconnects us into to life itself. And by doing that, we can rewire some of our bad ways of thinking, some of our conditioned ways of thinking, some of our bad habits. And these transcendent experiences can be triggered in all sorts of ways, by music, by being in nature, or by exercises in a classroom, such as drawing a mandala. And as we have those experiences, it enables us to go into a, a more natural, deeper state of mind, from which we know what sustainability and true emotional intelligence really is. And all this is, is at a level that complements our rational knowing and our experiential knowing. And by joining together in networks and sharing our experiences, particularly at this deeper level, so we can collaborate more to, to bring out this, this deeper knowing, this more connected, aware way of thinking of being human. If a caterpillar can change via a chrysalis to being a butterfly, what can we change into? Okay, we may need to go into a chrysalis-like state. Sometimes in this transcendent experience, our minds become mush. Our conscious minds <laughs> don't know what to think or feel because we're at a deeper state. But if we allow ourselves to go into that state of mind, into the chrysalis state, we can emerge as changed beings. I look forward to sharing the journey with you. Thank you.